We're, we are talking about prayer today. Last week we talked about the Bible. We're talking about core things. That this, this is us side of being God's people and being the church. The things that, that mark us, that make us unique. Our identity as believers, is, as a church family. And uh, today I want to focus on prayer. And not the concept of prayer, but the practice of prayer. And the challenges of prayer. So I want to start with a story. This is a guy named uh, Harry Kahn. He was one of the early pioneers in Hollywood. He was the head of Columbia Movie Studios. And he was one of the guys that was, I don't know, figured, how do you make a movie? How do you produce? How do you create? And, and so Harry had a brother who's a businessman back in New York, and his brother came out to Hollywood to see him. Well, he just thought Harry was a nut. His only brothers can think they are nuts. He this, you're doing everything wrong, this is wrong, and then they started going at it, like only brothers can go at it when they're disagreeing about things. And then brothers also know where, where to poke. They know where the weak spots are, they know where the difficulties are, and oh my goodness, Harry's brother was pushing him hard, and Harry said, what makes you think you know anything about anything? You don't even, you probably don't even know the Lord's Prayer. And his brother said, yes, I do. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Harry looked at him and said, well, I'll apologize. I, I really didn't think you knew it. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, and that was, that was wrong where? Uh, okay. We'll work on that another day. There's a lot we don't know, we don't understand, we don't do when it comes to prayer. But here's what we do know. Prayer has challenges to it. There are a lot of things about how God works, how God answers, uh, how God makes us wait that just make prayer tough. And there's so many things after a lot of practice of prayer and a lot of leaning into prayer for a long time. That a lot, I'm not, I just don't, I don't get it. Uh, I, I don't understand it. And especially when it gets down to living a life of prayer, a devotion, a real devotion, a heart thing in relationship to prayer and I, I talk to people go oh no prayer's easy but I think everyone I've ever talked to who said oh yeah prayer's always easy for me there are more popcorn prayers just, just popping up but not not the real dig in kind of prayer like you find in the Bible it's a different kind of prayer and we want to get to that kind of praying so why is prayer a challenge for us this is I'm leaving for Africa this week so I'm leaving you a lot now in your program today there is on a five point Fill in the blank thing, pretty cool, because you love filling in blanks here. But I have two bonus outlines that aren't even published. That's my gift to you before I leave for Africa. So here's the first bonus outline when it comes to prayer. And this is the way I want to say this. Prayer is a challenge for a lot of folks. It's how God works to advance his kingdom. But prayer is a different animal in these United States of America than it is in a lot of other places in the world. And I want to tell you why prayer is maybe more of a difficulty for us here than it is for people in other places in the world. And here's the first reason. Because here in our country, we just have too much. We're, we are too rich. You say, well, I'm not rich. Well, go hang out with me in Kenya for a week and you'll discover, well, I'm doing pretty good. And what that means is, we just don't desperately need God because we can handle most anything we're going to encounter. We're going to have the money for it. We're going to have insurance. We're going to have a safety net somewhere that's going to help us when things are hard. So we don't have to have God. And it's one of the reasons I say uh, I don't need, a Africa doesn't need me nearly as much as I need to go to Africa from time to time because it reminds me of things like this. When I hang out with people, it's so... Healthcare is complicated in the United States. I'm going to be spending time next Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to be standing in front of a group of people in a church in western Kenya, a pretty simple place, and sharing the, sharing the gospel. And in that context, uh, I'm going to be talking to people that say, what's your health care plan? And they say, well, we pray. That's all we've got is prayer. And when prayer is all you've got, you pray in a different way. And Jesus said, Pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. In our context, we don't really have a good handle on what that means. But I've hung out with people in a third world context where they pray differently because they have to pray for their daily bread. 
because they don't know that they will have bread today and they certainly don't know if they're going to have something to eat tomorrow. So in our country, we just don't have that sense of urgency because we have so much. Now, second reason, um, prayer is a little more complicated here than other places in the world because our lives are just too frenzied. We are so busy, so fragmented, so diluted by activity. We just don't have that much time, we feel like, to to still our hearts before Almighty God and and take time to listen. We'll throw out a bunch of requests to him. Fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this. Now I'm going on with my business. We don't take a lot of time to listen to what God has to say to us. And we're missing out on a lot of prayer because our lives are so consumed and so busy. The third reason, American Christianity is just far too earthly-minded. We don't have a lot. Everything about what's important, like, this is all there is. It's right here and right now. And if this isn't the way I want it to be, nothing's the way I want it to be. And we don't see that God's working a plan that's an eternal plan. It's going to reach way out there beyond this day, beyond these circumstances. And, and But we're, we're too earthly-minded often to be of any heavenly good, touching eternal things. So, the power of prayer. And the power of prayer should not be underestimated. I'm going to give you some of my favorite prayer verses in the Bible. I'll run through these quickly. The first one comes from James. James chapter 5, the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. God listens to the prayers, answers the prayers, moves in response to the prayers offered up in faith by his people. Jesus taught I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Wow, that's a pretty big deal. Nothing would be impossible. Prayer is powerful, Jesus says. The Apostle Paul tells us in the spiritual battles that we face, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. In Ephesians, Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication, offering up prayers for all the saints. So so how do we tap into this? I mean, the power of prayer, and this is a misunderstanding a lot of people have. The power of prayer is not in the person praying. The power of prayer is in God. And sometimes, and with the best of intentions, I know, and, and, and I've said it this way too, but think about what you're saying when you say prayer works. Prayer does not work. God works. You see the difference in that? If prayer works, it's just about me and what I'm doing. But it's God who works as God's people offer up prayers to him in faith. John wrote this. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So when we pray passionately, purposefully, according to his will, God responds in any variety of ways in power. So prayer is powerful, but this is the rest of that story. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? Sometimes you pray, and the mountains don't move. Sometimes you pray, and and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel even, much less the bright light of heaven shining all around you. Sometimes prayer, instead of being an encouragement that just, whoo, man, this is awesome, sometimes prayer offered up over and over again, uh, becomes discouraging. And I came across an an article, uh, in fact, something just around Christmas, Christmas time, and uh, it's just said it well that one of the reasons we get frustrated with prayer is because we have misunderstandings about who God is. Maybe back to last week, we haven't spent enough time in God's Word to really know how God does things, His character, His will, His ways, His purpose. And if we don't spend enough time with God and His Word, sometimes prayer gets a little fuzzy. So here's your second bonus outline today. 
And it is misunderstandings about God that make prayer more complicated. Here's the first one. The misunderstanding that God promises me a comfortable life. Man, that's a tough one for us. But for a whole lot of people, the idea is that God's job is just to make it easy. To eliminate the bumps, the, the hardships, the difficulties. And when we have an interruption or we have a tragedy or we're discomforted, we, we, we start peeling back a layer that shows this deceptive lie that we bought into that God's main job is just not to let that stuff happen. And here's what, you remember what Jesus promised his disciples? In this world you'll have what? Smooth sailing, easy going, always up and to the right. All, in this world you will have trial, tribulation. But he does say, but take courage. You know, I've overcome the world. You know, we, we think about Jesus saying, you know, Jesus, your marketing is terrible. Follow me and you will have trouble. Awesome. Sign me up for some of that. Cut me a big slice of that. But here's the thing. He says, you're going to have this, promises you something that's kind of ominous. You're not going to be comfortable when you're following me. But here's what I will give you. I'll give you a comforter. The Holy Spirit will be with you when you're one of my people. And he's going to carry you through whatever you're going through. And that's the hope that we have as Christ followers. It, it's, in, it's in that. Second thing, misunderstandings about God. When we pray, we believe God should do things my way. I, got, I, have, I have a plan and will for my life. And God's job is to make it come to pass. He's the magic genie in the bottle that I just asked to do it. Here's, here's the way I think it ought to work out. And so I have this certain vision, I have this certain dream of how work or family or my health or any number of things are supposed to work out. And when they don't start working out that way, we say, well, God's falling down the job. Because who knows better than me how the universe should be run? Who knows better than me how all the details of my life should be ordered? Well, here's what the Bible says about God. This is the Lord, say, the, thus saith the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You ever had young children tell you how your world ought to be at your house? And you say, well, the problem is you're a child and I'm an adult. You ever had that glorious conversation with your children when they're little? There are some things I know that you just don't know yet. And God says the same thing to us as his children sometimes. That I know you think you have it all figured out, but truth is, I may have a better idea about the universe than you do. Here's the third one. Misunderstandings about God. God should work according to my timetable. Sometimes the discouragement in prayer. And this is, this is the one that is the wrestling match for me often in prayer is that I, I really think everything ought to be fixed right now. And God's working a different plan than that. He's on a different timeline because he is wiser and he sees things I don't see. And we struggle with that in prayer. And sometimes we'll throw up our hands and abandon ship in, in, the, in the focus on prayer. Uh, the Bible has that statement, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you're having to wait for too long, when it's too hard for the, the, the journey just wears you down and it kind of burns you out. Uh, it's tough to say, I'm going to keep on asking. I'm going to keep on leaning. I'm going to keep on, I will trust in you when the mountains don't move, as we were saying earlier. When God doesn't work on the timetable, we prefer. Uh, we get frustrated with that side of it. And my experience, though, because I've been living with the Lord for a while now, is in those times where I'm waiting, and it seems like I've waited for a really long time, if I'll just lean into him, it's kind of like climbing up in his lap a little bit and him, him teaching me things and caring for me. And I learn things about him and I learn things about me and I learn things about the world in those waiting times that have been some of the most productive things he's ever done in my spirit through the journey over time. And if he was just fixing it immediately, I wouldn't learn those lessons. Uh, I'd, I'd start thinking of him as a magic genie and I think that everything should always work to my comfort and it would distort my view of God and my world and myself and God's plan and sovereignty again and again God is a patient father invites us to exchange 
those lies, those distortions for his truth. And if you'll really lean into the truth of who he is and what he's about, his truth will set you free from, from the struggle of whatever you're facing. Now, Acts chapter 12. And this is just a great prayer story. And I'm going to read it, but I want to give you some context leading up to it. So here's, this is, this is like on, you're watching your TV show and, uh, last week on Hawaii Five O, and here's what you missed to get you up to speed on where you are. The gospel is spreading like wildfire, and God is moving in dramatic ways, and people are, are they're, they're seeing miraculous signs and wonders, miraculous things, and people who are far from God are, are making dramatic commitments to the Lord. The kingdom of God is expanding. However, the church has experienced resistance. Multiple levels, multiple people, multiple sources. But God's still working. And he's being so faithful. And God's people are faithful to join God in his work. Then, here's what happens. There's this church leader. He's one of the first seven deacons that the church calls out. His name is Stephen. And Stephen, he's a, he's a remarkable man. But because of his testimony for Christ, he is singled out. And the religious leaders... The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, they, they single him out. Uh, he preaches a great sermon, and they don't like a bit of it. And they, they, they drag him off, and they stone him to death. First Christian martyr in the New Testament. He, that means they threw rocks at him until it killed him. Now, here's, here's how this affected his church, the church there in Jerusalem, the gathering of believers in Jerusalem. People have kind of been sitting and soaking and they're loving seeing God at work and they're loving one another and they're loving the Lord and they're happy where they are. But this is in the worst of things. That was the event that shook them loose from kind of fat and happy at Jerusalem and they're fearing for their lives and that fear drove them outside of Jerusalem and they start spreading out across, across uh, the countryside out beyond their borders but here's the, here's the good news of that. They took Jesus with them. They took this gospel message with them. And they start telling this story to other people. And other people, they think it's pretty incredible too. And the gospel begins to expand. Now there was a guy right at the end of that story of Stephen. His name is Saul. And he was a Pharisee. And he thought, these Christians need to be shut down. These people of the way, as it was referred to early in the book of Acts. And he didn't shut them down. And so he starts rounding up these new Christ followers and arresting them and jailing them, brutalizing them. And he has his Damascus Road experience. Bright light shines from heaven. Glorious Christ speaks to him. And he is dramatically, miraculously transformed by Jesus Christ. And he start, instead of persecuting Christians, he is... He's an advocate now. And he's telling the story and he's challenging people's thought process on who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. And so what happens is God's moving and he's calling out more people to share with more people. And Peter gets mixed into this and God's working in his heart, changing how he thinks about things. Is this just for the Jewish people? No, it's for the Gentiles too. And all of a sudden this becomes a missionary enterprise that has a worldwide touch to it. They're going to go everywhere with the good news of Jesus. These Christian movements are spreading out, and there's an influential city in Antioch. It, it, is, it is really a key city for all kinds of things. And people start going there and telling people about Jesus, and people start believing. And Antioch, they're first called Christians, little Christ, followers of Christ in Antioch. And the Jerusalem church says, oh my goodness, folks up there, they're... Oh, God's doing all kinds of things. We need to send one of our guys up there to check on them, make sure they have everything they need. They're getting trained. They're being grown. Let's send old Barnabas, son of encouragement. Barnabas will take care of him. So Barnabas goes up there. He says, man, this is a whole lot going on. I'm going to need some help. And he goes and grabs that guy, Saul, that now is called Paul, brings him back to Antioch, and they start working together, and God starts doing things there. And Again, you're seeing the movement of the Lord. Then right at the end of Acts chapter 11, you have problems, you have challenges, a lot of change, and change is always complicated, and change always challenges hearts, and there are people who like it and people who don't, and 
So there's all kinds of conflicts, and, but there's so much good stuff going on. And then some guy who has a gift of prophecy, he shows up and says, there's going to be a terrible famine, and it's especially going to be bad in Jerusalem. Well, thanks for nothing, you know. That, thanks for sharing that with us. So that happens. And then we get to chapter 12. And in the middle of all that, lots of good things, movement of God, God's still speaking through a prophet, tell, warning about what's coming. Those first two verses of chapter 12 of Acts just brutalize. About that time, verse 1, about that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison. Talking about Peter. Delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. He figured him to be a dangerous character. He was intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But then that last half of verse 5. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. They are praying people. Verse 6. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, sentries before the door were guarding the prison. He is a, he is a high, uh, high-risk prisoner, according to Herod, I guess. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly! And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He didn't know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Okay, well, you know, this is as happy a dream as I'm going to have in prison, so I'm going to go with it, he says. When he had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me by the hand of, from the hand of Herod from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. He's going to show up again in this story of Acts, and he's also, uh, also going to write a book named Mark. It shows up in our Bible. Well, many people were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked on the door, this is my favorite part of the whole story, I think. When he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, oh, you're out of your mind. But she kept the people who were praying for his release, said, please don't bother our prayer meeting. We're praying that Peter will be released. You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel, whatever that meant. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Okay. I want to make some observations about prayer from this story. And here's the first one from those first couple of verses of the chapter. The circumstances of life will call us to prayer. The circumstances of life call us to prayer. The early church was working with an ever-expanding, ever more complicated ministry reach. A famine was coming. But those first two verses just take this to a different level. And it comes so, so suddenly and so violently. Uh, they, they've been opposed before by the Jewish leaders, but this time it's not them. This time it is Herod. Now Herod, this is, there are different Herods in the Bible. This is Herod Agrippa I. And he's the grandson of Herod the Great from the story of Jesus' birth. That Herod, that Herod this is Herod Agrippa I. And he's a pretty rough character. And sometimes you like to have a little bit more warning, a little easing into a story like that. But it just says, so Herod killed James. Brother of John. You know, in the Gospels, you find uh, Peter seems to be the leader of the group, and Jesus spends a lot of time with Peter. But then there's, there's three that he spends more time with. They're, they're with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're there with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, 
Peter, James, and John, these two brothers. And it just says, <laughs> no details or anything. He, he took James and executed him. And then he arrested Peter. Man, this is a harsh, dark beginning to a chapter in the Bible. And what do you do in such a situation? Because most of the things that happen to us happen like that. Not with a lot of warning, not with a big introduction. They just, one day, there comes a day. And everything shifts and everything changes. And it's a different story now. And it's a different trajectory of your life And when this moment comes. And for these people, they're, they're not... They're not wealthy. They're, they're not strong politically. They don't have clout in society. And so all they had available to them was prayer. That was the only way this was going to... And so what did they do? They did the only thing they could do. They prayed. And prayer is what you do and prayer is all you've got. Has life ever brought you to that spot where... Uh, I, 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 I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have another option. Prayer is, prayer is all I've got. Thing is, if God didn't bring us to those spots, a lot of us would never even think about the Lord. We, we'd never know we have to have him if he didn't bring us to a spot where he just brings us to our knees. And many of you have a story where there came a day when all I could do was drop to my knees and call on the Lord because I... I I didn't have anything else that that I could do. As a firefighter, I read this story as a firefighter. He was coming in to do his fire safety talk with a group, school group, group of kindergartners. There's nothing more adventurous than hanging out with a group of kindergartners. I did some of that this morning. They're fun. They'll say anything and everything, and they'll keep you on your toes. You know, last week, those of you who missed last week because the weather day, well, you missed out. The children's sermon in this hour got right out from under me. I thought I had them, and they just, they just, they bolted, and they, they knocked my legs out from under me. They took over. They ran the whole rest of the service. Uh, so this firefighter, he's talking to a group of kindergartners, and uh, he says to them, okay, so if the fire alarm's going off in your house, and the, you, or you smell smoke, one of the first things you do, and some of you have had this fire safety talk, so you, you lightly touch the door to see if the door's hot. So that's the first step. You don't open the door if it's, if it's hot for sure. And the second thing is you drop down on your knees because you know that smoke is going to tend to run a little higher up. And you can better chance of breathing well down here. But he said, so touch the door. Second thing, drop down on your knees. You know why you drop down on your knees? And one of the little girls said, because you got to pray to God. God, get me out of this mess. <laughs> well, you know. There have been times in my life where I just kind of dropped down to my knees in the midst of crisis and said, God, you just got to get me out of this mess because I don't have anywhere to go, anything to do. God will bring us to that spot. Herod Agrippa I had no place for God in his life. And he set about to persecute those who did. A crisis came for the church in Jerusalem and they found themselves at the end of their resources most of us do think we can handle just about anything, and if it weren't for crisis times, we might never look to God. God has a way of bringing us to the end of our rope. Now, uh, in those times, y- you need to pray. But here, here's the thing about prayer, is that if you haven't been practicing prayer and growing in prayer, and along the way, when you get to that crisis time, you feel like the person that, oh my goodness, there's a little fire in our house, and Where's the fire extinguisher? Well, then you run around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to remember where the fire extinguisher is. Then you have to crack open the cardboard box it's in because you never opened it after you bought it. And then you're running toward the fire, reading the instructions so you don't shoot yourself in the face with it because you really don't know how to use the thing. And we feel that way in a moment of crisis sometimes in relationship to prayer because we say, well, I'm, I got to pray, but I, I don't know what to do or what to say or how to go at it. And I'm afraid I'm going to use it wrong. And here's what I'll say to you. God just wants you to call out to him. He's not looking for uh, perfection when you pray. He's not looking for all this piety. He's not looking for uh, poetry. He 
I just want you to talk to him and to tell and to say, God, here's where it is, and here's what I need, and I'm going to trust you. Even when I can't see it, when I, can't, I don't understand it, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to believe that you are able when I'm not. Just pray. Just pray. Here's the second thing. In this story, the sovereignty of God works through prayer. Boy, this is a big mystery. Because God really does see things I don't see. He knows things I don't know. He's king, you know, king of kings, lord of lords. And I'm just going to miss a lot that I'm not going to understand about how God does things. God, God always answers prayer. But not always the way I want him to answer prayer. Uh, sometimes he does say yes, just the way I ask it. Sometimes he says no. And then sometimes I'm just wondering what he's doing. So here's the, here, here, here's the story. Peter was in prison. We read the whole thing. Peter's in prison. It's not looking good for him. And the people got together and they prayed. And he is miraculously delivered. Amen. Amen. This is a great story. God answered our prayer, right? Okay, here's the rest of the story. Do you think they prayed any less for James when he got arrested? And yet he was executed. So why did God do it this way in the case of Peter and this way in the case of James? Why does, why does he do things the way he does? Well, because he's God and he knows some things I probably don't know. God always answers prayer, but not always the way we want it answered. Paul talks about it in, in his own walk with God. He, he says, I have this thorn in the flesh. I pray that God would take it away. And, you know, we don't, we don't know what that is for a guy like me who, who struggles a lot with some vision things, especially over the last few years. I think Paul, there's some, there's some clues that make me think Paul was having some vision issues that were going to keep him from doing what he wanted to do and accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish. Some people think because of other clues in Paul's writings that maybe he picked up malaria while he was in Galatia and uh, malaria is a recurring struggle and he, he was just weary of getting sick over and over again. He said, God, I want, you to, I want you to free me from this. I want you to heal me from this. I think it's slowing me down, and keeping me from really serving you the way I ought to serve you. And God, God says, no, I'm not going to do that. But I'm not wasting it. Because there's some things God wanted to develop in, Peter, in, in Paul's character. Some things he needed to know. Some things he needed to understand. Some things that... He needs some humility about that we're going to make him better at everything with his thorn in the flesh. The Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. I need to weaken you a little bit to, to make you more effective in doing my work. The Bible doesn't teach that if we badger God enough, or if we get enough people all praying the same thing in the same direction, or we get the right people praying, that God is always going to answer just the way we want Him to answer. Because if that was the case, the power of prayer would depend on us. The power in what God does in prayer depends on God. He's the power of prayer. It's not a formula. It's not just saying it the right way or having the right posture. All the, it, It's something God does in his perfect plan, according to his perfect will, and we trust him. Prayer is God just letting us be a part of his plan for our lives and plan for the world, trusting and leaning into him. Here's the second thing, or third thing, about prayer in this passage. The people of God must believe in prayer. We just, it needs, this is us. It needs to be us. I'll tell you this. 21 years I have been in this place. This is the third time I have shared a story about a pastor with a parrot. This is the third of the three stories I have about a pastor who had a parrot. I do not have a fourth story about a pastor with a parrot. So I've run the gamut of my pastor with a parrot stories, and today you get to hear the third one. So this is a big day for you to be at church. So there was this pastor that had a parrot. 
And the parrot, some of you have heard this before because it's an old story told by an old man. This pastor had a parrot. But the parrot had belonged to a previous owner who was just really a foul-mouthed character, and the parrot had picked up a lot of bad habits. And this is a little embarrassing to the pastor. By the way, just because there are three parrot stories, parrot pastor with a parrot story, there is no clue tied to that that says you can, you know what we need to get Chad for his birthday? <laughs> I'm not looking for a parrot. It's a foul-mouthed parrot. Pastor struggled with this. Well, he shared it with a group of people, and one of the ladies in that group that he was sharing with, this is kind of frustrating. I like the parrot. Whoa, they're foul mouth parrot. And uh, the, one of the women said, You know, I have a parrot too, Pastor. And it's a female parrot, and uh, this is the sweetest uh, little bird. I just love my parrot. And she doesn't have a wide vocabulary, apparently, like your male parrot, but uh, in fact, the only thing she says, it's such an encouragement to me. Every time I walk in, my, my sweet little girl parrot, she just says, let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, it warms my heart. Maybe we put them together. My, my parrot could rub off on your foul mouth parrot. So they put them, put them side by side in a cage. As soon as they put them in there, the male parrot, he looked over at the female parrot. And he said, hey, good looking. How about a kiss? The female parrot looked at him and said, my prayers have been answered. I don't have a fourth story, so that's, that's all I got, 21 years. Okay. Do you really believe in prayer? And here's the thing. I'm not talking about, I believe in the concept of prayer. I believe in the theory of prayer. But do you really believe prayer can accomplish things? Have you seen prayer answered? Do you believe in the power of prayer when you're talking to a real and powerful God? Peter's friends believed in prayer. Now, we don't have any backstory on this. They gather together for prayer, but we don't know, well, did they raise their hands? Did they fall on their faces? Did they cry out loud? Did they, did they pray silently? How were they praying? What was the secret formula to prayer? Do you know how I know that they believed in prayer? The same way, the same way I can know that, that any of you believe in prayer, because they prayed. That's, how, that's when you know you believe in prayer. When that's your go-to move, you pray. These folks believed in prayer, had a commitment to prayer because they prayed. And that's what God's asking of us. Just pray. Just pray. Fourth thing. The supernatural resources of God respond to prayer. So here's Peter in a bad way. There's no team of commandos that's going to sweep into that prison and, and rescue him. All his friends could do was pray. So how is God, you, you heard the description, there are layers of security wrapped around him. How, how do you know that God, uh, how's God going to accomplish this? Well, let's see, maybe, maybe God will send an angel to go into the prison and walk him right out the front door past everybody without incident. Maybe that's how God will do it. Because God is, is God. And that's how he did it. Today, I know some of you are facing some difficult situations. Some of you, I don't know your story, but you've got a story right now. And it feels hopeless. And you can't see your way out. Well, this is your lucky day because God, God specializes in difficult situations. And what can God do? Well, you know what God can do? Can a boy with a slingshot kill a giant? Can a man in a den of hungry lions overnight uh, come away unharmed? Can three friends survive a fiery furnace? Can fire from heaven come down to prove who God is? Can the blind see the lame walk, the deaf hear? Can God, can God see the dead raised to life again? Sometimes he does it that way, in supernatural ways that bear fingerprints of his glory that say, oh my goodness. So, so pray big. You know, the, the phrase that I use, I, I, in any circumstance, I don't know what God's will is for your life in any given day, any given circumstances, but I'll tell you this, I don't do a lot of, I believe that God's will is prevailing, but I don't do a lot of praying if you've hung out with me in crisis times. I don't do a lot of, God, if it's your will, because when I start praying, I'm going to swing for the fences when I pray. 
I'm going to ask him for everything there is to ask for and I'll let God sort it out from there. But I'm going to, I believe he can do miraculous things. And sometimes he has. And some of you bear the fingerprints of that work of God. And sometimes he has a different plan uh, that maybe I understand now, maybe not this side of heaven, heaven, but ask big because God does big things. Here's a fifth thing. The Lord surprises even the faithful with his answers to prayer. <laughs> These are praying people. And again, my favorite parts of the story. So first is this young girl, Rhoda. Peter, hey, anybody home? Anybody home? He knows they're gathered up for prayer. And she hears his voice. But instead of letting him in, she leaves him out in the cold. And she runs back and says, Peter is outside. And they again say, hey, we're having a prayer meeting here that Peter would be released. Could you keep it down out there? And Peter, I got to think, he, the angel goes to all this trouble. And, hello? Hello? Is anybody looking through the windows? Anybody home? Somebody let me in. And they're busy praying for his release. And Peter is outside and has been released. And they tell her she's crazy. Has this ever happened to you where you, you're, you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and then it just all happens? And you just, oh, where did that come from? And how did that come to be? And and I, I just didn't I, didn't, I never imagined that God would actually do it. And even God's people, when, when you're trusting him and believing, sometimes you, you, still, you still just get surprised by prayer. I talked to you a little bit about this in the service last week. And I'm going to sit down to tell you a story. So... I I don't talk a lot about my family. I don't I don't peel back layers of us um, in here usually. I like to kind of build a build a wall around my wife and kids, and I'll mention them; they'll come up. But I don't I don't just throw down often. Uh, but I, I want to tell you a story because it's a prayer story, and it's uh, it's about my son Austin, uh, and. He and I have talked about it, and uh, he's, he, he was glad with me, good with me sharing a whole lot more than I'm going to share today. And so I just want to tell you, kind of a, here's me and Rhonda and our son Austin's story. So Austin, we came, when we came to Allen, he was uh, four years old. And he grew up in this church, and uh, he was a part of everything that happens here, all layers of ministry on Sundays and Wednesdays and as he got older you know it's camps and mission trips and all that stuff he accepted Christ here he was baptized here and uh, as you know works with kids teenagers especially you know we had our ups and downs and aggravations but it's pretty easy and then uh, he went off to college went to a Baptist school things were going great so going well at all levels. He met somebody that he really thought was a person he was going to marry, maybe. And uh, but but there were a series of things that were converging. And that relationship blew up, and so did he. And a lot of stuff, the wheels just came off a lot of things in his life. And we tried to coach him through, and we tried to pray, and we tried to encourage, and we tried to help at multiple levels, multiple layers. But there were things that were still digging into him that were just so very dark that we had no idea about at the time. And there came a day when I called school and trying to get information, and... Uh, picked up a little bit more information and I said Austin I'm, I'm coming we're going to sort this out with the school and sort it out with you to figure out what's really going on because I don't think I'm getting a straight story and he okay so I drove Arkansas Arkadelphia Arkansas and I said 
we, I met him in the fast food place. And I said, Austin, what's going on? And he pulled out papers and he said, I've, uh, I've withdrawn from school this morning. And, and I'll pay back what we owe to the school. But I, I, Dad, I'm so sorry. And I've done so many things. But I know this. If, if I'm going to have any opportunity to have a relationship with you and Mom going forward, I'm just going to have to do this myself. And I'm going to have to... I, I just have to cut things off with you guys right now. Because it's, there's, there's a lot. And it's Austin, we can work with you. We can sort this out. We can find a way. We can work with the school. We can. And he said, "No, it's. This is just where it is, and you, you have to let me do this." And, and he said, "And I know, I need to give you my car." And one of our deals was when he went back that semester, uh, he said, "If you fail a class, you, know, you need to give me the car back. That'll eliminate one distraction." And and I remember then, you know, next day, I dropped off at his squalor of an apartment. He was living with a squalor of a roommate. And, uh, and I hugged him, and I said, I will always love you. And he said, I love you, but I have to do this. And he handed me the keys to that car, and I climbed in the car, and I drove away with him walking back into that place, And I cried for the next couple of hours. <laughs> it was the hardest. It was the hardest moment I've ever been through, with you know, kids that's so unimaginable, and I was so helpless. And so, Rhonda and I, we we tried to stay in touch. We kept a phone on him uh, until things got so bad that he sold the phone for food. Uh, but for the next two years, and again. All this is happening while I'm up here talking to you every Sunday and doing all the stuff I do. But this is the backstory of what's going on with me and Rhonda and, and our son. And so uh, he wouldn't respond to calls. He'd sometimes respond to a text. And so I stayed in touch a little bit, made lots of trips that way so that you know, let's get together. And he'd sometimes meet us to eat and... Uh, but as soon as we were done eating, he was gone. Christmas, Thanksgiving start passing, you know, and that's, that's the world we're living in. And it just gutted us. And we just kept praying. And so many sweet folks, you guys, you, you stepped in there with us and you prayed with us in that, in that time. And, uh, you know, at one point... Uh, we thought, we're going to call one of his friends uh, that we, we managed to get a number for. We're going to see what he can tell us. <laughs> I told Rhonda, uh, as I listened to her talk to him on the phone, one of his former roommates, I said, you broke him down under cross-examination. That kid started spilling his guts about a whole lot of stuff. But the stuff that he told us made everything darker and everything uglier. And it, it was it was such a horrible, horrible level. And, and so unimaginable for, for our sweet little family uh, from Allen, Texas. They were just killing us. But all we could do was pray. And, and so that was our journey. And then there was a, it was a Monday. Our staff likes to do staff lunch together. Uh, on Mondays, like, well, we always, a whole staff comes together every morning, Monday through Friday. We pray together, beginning of our day, and then we take off, do our thing. So Monday, you know, we're getting things ready and preparing towards Sunday with publications and all that. And then at noon on Mondays, our staff has lunch together most every Monday. It's one of our, my favorite things we do. We, we really enjoy being together and laughing, and we talk about our life stuff and what's going on. And, um, so we were at our staff lunch on a Monday, and my phone rang, and my caller ID says, it's Austin. 
This was the first time in two years he had initiated contact with me, with us. And so I stepped out quickly and took the call. I said, hey, Austin, what's going on? He didn't beat around the bush. He just said, Dad, I want to come home. And, you know, I, I couldn't breathe. And I could barely speak. Because I've been praying this hard for a long time. And he, at that point, we knew some of this story because we picked up bits and pieces. He, he's like the prodigal son. He's in the, it's down to the pig pen level of things. He's down to nothing. And, and he said, I want to come home. And there's more to that part of the story that's fascinating. But, but like the father and the prodigal son, I ran to the end of the road to meet him as fast as I could go. And we knew, you know, that wasn't going to be the end of the hard. We and you, some of you guys did a lot of praying once he was home because it was rough. And, you know, for months, I, I just got up, I got up multiple times every night and just to see, is he still breathing and is he still here? Uh, it, he hasn't just left, and God has been doing this work in, in him and in us, and, and we look back now, now these years later, and he's going he's gonna to graduate in May from Dallas Baptist University with a 4.0, and he loves the Lord, and he's telling, the reason he, I could tell this story is because he's been telling it, because God, he knows God's done this work. And we just never would have imagined where God is today with him and with us. But on that day when he called, you know, it's one of God's people who's been praying hard. He, I can't believe God's actually done it. And on this occasion, he just happened to do it the way I asked him to. Uh, and my... My prodigal son came home. And I tell you that story to say, I prayed for other things that it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. That it didn't come together the way I hoped it would come together. But I just tell you that story to say, don't ever stop praying. Don't ever stop asking. Don't ever stop swinging for the fences. Because prayer is powerful because the one we're talking to is God and he's powerful some of you sitting in here for a hundred different reasons you just need something big from God today and like in the first hour some of you it's just hit you a wave has just swept over you and you feel like it's sweeping you out to sea and for others of you you've been on that journey for decades and it just feels really stuck. Pray. And pray. And pray. Because even if all the circumstances don't shift to be what, exactly what you want them to be, spending that time with God is going to do a whole lot in you to take on whatever you're facing. And that's why we pray. Now, in all of this, the first thing I want to tell you, just don't ever stop praying. Don't ever give up. And sometimes, like we sang the song earlier, sometimes God moves the mountain. And sometimes the mountain does not move. But God still moves. Keep praying. Keep trusting. And just know you can trust him. If whatever he's doing, you can trust him. Here's the second thing. You really can't do this without him. And if you don't know Jesus, you've never had a time in your life where you said, I don't have, I can't fix me, I can't fix my world, I can't fix my kids, I can't. But I'm going to throw everything 
my sin, my brokenness, my waywardness. I'm, I'm trusting Jesus to fix all of that because he died on the cross to pay for my sin. He was raised from the dead. And I'm going to surrender my life to him as the king of my life. And I want to follow him with all my heart for the rest of my days. If you have that locked down, it'll carry you through a lot of things that are hard. And you'll see a lot of victory things too. There are a lot of next step commitments. Here's your one more. A lot of you. This is, I have, I, have a, uh, I have a book that I got when I was in seminary from a professor. And he wrote a book called The Wounded Parent. And it's when, as a parent, Ron and I are far from perfect parents. But when, when as a parent, you invest and you pray and you do all this stuff. But in spite of all that, your kids still make choices. There's still free will in them. And when they make choices, just disappoint you, crush you. When, when, they, when, they, when they step away from your values, from, your, what, what, from the Lord, uh, you can be a wounded parent. Some of your wounded parents. And Rhonda and I were talking about this uh, last week. And... Uh, we just like try to round some of us up that are wounded parents that are on that kind of journey and are parenting and, and uh, maybe get together to, to do some things because there are some steps that are involved in being a wounded parent and there are as a grief process that happens in that and you just need the prayer support and encouragement of other people who love Jesus when you're on that journey and maybe, maybe, maybe you'd like to I'd like to get together with some other people who've struggled and maybe that'd be a good spot for me to plug in just now. Um, well, send, send an email to me. Just say, Chad, when it happens, I'd like to be a part of it. Uh, my email's, I think it's in the bulletin, chad.self at fbcallen.org. Send an email, call the church and let somebody know, hey, tell Chad to sign me up. And uh, probably right after spring break season, we'll round up a time to get together. Just talk about what God might be doing, how we can support and encourage one another in that journey as uh, wounded parents. Okay? Maybe that's the next step for you. Prayer, prayer, prayer is powerful because God is powerful.